my question is simply this. I don't know if it's necessarily simple, but is Mormonism the same as Christianity, and why or why not? Yes. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You know, are you aware that I spoke at the Mormon Tabernacle a few years ago? Did you know that? Okay, yeah. Boy, did I ever take some heat for that. Uh, they sent three, one apostle and one professor, and one of the men came to my office several years ago, and they asked me if I would come and speak in the Mormon Tabernacle. And I was stunned, you know. I go to places where I feel they need the message the most, so I do yeah, listen earnestly. So I said, why? Why are you asking me? They said, we believe that you'll have a message for us. I said, has any evangelical ever spoken there? They said, 104 years ago, Dale Moody. I said, oh, wow. If he spoke there, I could probably say, okay. So I said, um, <laughs> I said two conditions. I get to speak, pick the subject, I get to bring the music. So they said, what will your subject be? I said, the exclusivity and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. They said, we'd have to ask the head apostle on that one, but they said it. <laughs> and they said, music? I said, I'd like to bring Michael Card with me. So, um, they, they, they said, okay. So I phoned Michael Card. He said, I'll drop everything I'm doing and I'm going to come. And Michael Card sang, were you there, Stacy? Yes, yeah. Stacy used to be on our staff. Then she went the way of all flesh, got married, and we're trying to kidnap her and get her back to Atlanta now. Her mother's been heavily involved in putting all of this together, by the way. We love her out there and miss her so much. But we had this Mormon tabernacle, and uh, he sang he, a song that he wrote from Peter's encounter with Cornelius, the words were, I'm not supposed to be here. You talk about 7,000 people listening to a song, I'm not supposed to be here. And he's talking about the gospel. And I, if you want to listen to that message that I delivered, we still have it, and we get a lot of Mormon people writing in for it. I compromise nothing on the message. I even address them, uh, the, the uniqueness of the Trinity in there, and the exclusivity and the completeness of the work of Christ. And I spoke, I think, at Brigham Young, and one of the universities did open forums there and so on. Just about a month ago, the number three apostle flew back to Atlanta, and they're talking to me about coming back to the universities and doing open forums. So the first thing I say to you is, I took a lot of heat for that. I took a lot of flack, and some of the radio programs are really going after me. That's all right. At this stage in my life, I have to do what I believe God is calling me to do. If I can take the message to hostile arenas in India and Pakistan and other places, so why am I not going to take it to places that disagree with me? It's the, uh, I'm not just going to people who agree with me, I go to people who disagree with me even more than, than, than that. And uh, it took a lot of flack because Walter Martin's family had asked me to edit, after he passed away, the book, The Kingdom of the Cult. So my name is writ large on the top of that book. And of course, Mormonism is one of the chapters in there. But they knew I would be respectful but I would not be compromising. But here's what I say to you. Classical historic Mormonism has to answer this question. When the Christian uses the word cult, Christian, not generally speaking, when the Christian uses the word cult, a cult is generally defined as that which claims to be rooted in historic Christianity but has deviated or abandoned the finished work of Christ or compromised on his person. That's the definition, okay? So in strict Christian terms, yes, Christ was not sufficient. Today, if you talk to an average Mormon around the table, he says, no, I, I, I follow Jesus Christ. And then you bring all the other doctrines that I've added on, and some of them get very uncomfortable with what it is, the Adam-God doctrine, the celestial marriage, the doctrine and the covenants, the pearl of great price, and uh, all of these other additions that were brought in there. I think that it is critical we understand that, the, that Jesus said we are complete in him. And when you add or detract, you can give yourself whatever name you want, but you're impugning the completed work of Christ on the cross. Okay, so there are other titles that one can give to those faiths, but it is not historic Christianity at that point. 
Now, I think your question goes deeper, and I want to be very careful, and I may be hit out here badly. Does one vote for a candidate who belongs, say, to a faith other than the Christian faith? Everyone has to vote according to their conscience and what God is prompting them to do because it's a very privileged role that we are given in this nation. My view of the philosophy of history and politics is this. When you're choosing between leaders, none of whom will give you the groundswell of the Christian faith on which their life is built, which may not guarantee that they may make the best leader either, you know. But if that's not there, you have to go for a person who will help a nation provide the best moral soil on which the freedom to believe and disbelieve can actually function. It is on a moral soil that the freedom to believe actually works best and truth can ultimately triumph. If you have an immoral soil created, then the truth is evicted and you're not even given to the opportunity of voicing your ideas in the marketplace and in the public setting and in the arena. The Christian faith ought to have a voice in the marketplace. It ought to have a voice in the academy. It ought to have a voice in politics. It ought to have a voice in business. And any leader that will create the moral soil to make it possible for us to continue to pro proclaim that, that's the kind of leader we may have to ultimately work, no matter what tag they put on them on the outside, if you're choosing between those for whom the Christ is not supreme in salvation, you have to choose one who will give you the best moral soil in order to allow you to live for Christ and live out your faith. That's the implication of the answer that I have given to you. Okay. Can, I, can I go back and add one footnote to the previous question? And I think it's important I say this because these things are recorded. In in uh, theological terms and Christian terms, what we define a cult is the way I have given it to you. A departure from the historic person and the work of Christ has been deemed cultic if it still lays claim to the historic work but has departed from it. But to use it in a general sense, in a general community, in a general audience, is not a wise way to do it. You use that in a setting of theological debate and dialogue and discussion. When the word is tossed around like that in a public setting, because of all the issues we had with people like Jim Jones and others, it brings baggage with the term that makes it much more than what a mere theological discussion would be. So that's a term we leave for the classroom, not for a public arena because it says much more than what I think one is intending to say with a statement like that. We need to be wise and be mindful of the implications of a, of a loosely used word. It's a very technical word reserved for a theological discussion around a table or a lecture hall. With that in mind, we shall go back and uh, I shall go and look at the mountains and uh, you can continue to do what you're doing. My brother, I don't know, Tyler or Les, which of you are there is Tyler. Thanks, by the way, for having me. It's been great and God bless you. <clears throat> so I'm going to do some signing. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.